hello again. Today, we're going to talk about mechanisms of pathogenesis, how viruses cause disease. This is going to be important for us as we move on to talk about how individual viruses cause disease. And today, we're going to focus on what viruses do to hosts in order to cause the disease, how we know, how do we measure it, and so forth. And the first thing we need to talk about is how we study pathogenesis. We obviously make lots of observations in people, and we'll talk about that, but a great deal of what we understand about how viruses cause disease come from using animal models. And the first thing you need to remember about an animal model for a virus disease is captured by this statement, mice lie and monkeys exaggerate because no animal model predicts what happens in people. It may, but you can't assume that it, that it does. And this is why, for example, when pharmaceutical companies develop new drugs, they test them extensively in animal models, which are selected to be as close as possible to what happens in people. I'll give you an example. For years, my wife studied drugs for hypertension. Guess what the best animal model for that is? A rabbit. Now, you wouldn't think that by looking at a rabbit and a human side by side, right? But it just turns out that the physiology is very similar. Nevertheless, whatever animal model you use, whether it's for pharmaceutical drugs or viruses, you always have to do a clinical trial, right? And guess what? Many drugs fail once they go into humans. They just don't have the same effects as in animals. So the same goes for studies of viral pathogenesis in animals. We can do lots of experiments, and they give us great information, but you always have to be able to see if it's true in humans, and sometimes you simply can't do that. You can't infect people with viruses. You have to make epidemiological observations and so forth and try and see if what you've learned in the animal is right. Now, what kinds of animal models can we use? We use mice a lot in the laboratory because they're easy to breed. We can genetically manipulate them. But it turns out that they don't work for every virus, so sometimes we need to move to other animal models. But here are some examples of how you can make a mouse a surrogate for a human virus infection. So for example, we can give mice the genes encoding human receptors for viruses in case they don't happen to have them. Sometimes you can put the whole viral genome into mice. This has been done for hepatitis B virus. You put the whole genome in mice, and it cranks out virus proteins. Or you can put individual viral genes in and see their effects. And then you measure disease, the host response, and so forth, and immune responses. You can also genetically manipulate the mice to make them more suitable models. In the immune system, at least, you can add clonal T cell receptors in. You can, you can delete specific subsets of immune cells. We, we gave an experiment like that last time where we deplete antibodies or B cells or T cells with specific reagents, or you can overproduce specific immune mediators. So there are lots of ways to use mice. Now, typically, there, in terms of the virus, some human viruses will replicate in mice or in other animals, but others simply will not you have a, a virus causing a human disease. Well, HIV is a good example. It doesn't replicate at all in mice. You can manipulate them extensively to get them to replicate, but many people use other kinds of uh, animals to do that. If you can't get your virus to replicate in animals, you can find sometimes a, an animal virus that will infect the mice and it resembles a human infection. So we'll see examples of this as we go through. So you can take a human virus and an animal. And by the way, an extension of that, sometimes the human virus won't grow in mice, won't replicate, but sometimes if you passage it multiple times, you, you will do what we call mouse adaptation. And that virus now sustains mutations, which allow it to replicate in mice, and you can use that as a model. Some people don't like that because those mutations aren't present in viruses that infect people, but you can still harvest information. So we can use human viruses animal, or animal viruses that resemble human infections. And as we'll go through the next set of lectures, you'll see examples of both. So I came to Columbia in 1982. 
And I wanted to make a mouse model to study poliovirus. I had done polio research as a postdoc, and I used cells and culture, but I wanted to study pathogenesis. This was the beginning of the era of doing pathogenesis. And one of my first students, Kathy Mendelson, she identified the cellular receptor for poliovirus. She cloned the gene and showed that the encoded protein, if you produce it in a mouse cell, Polio will then infect the mouse cells. So mice, mouse cells are not susceptible to polio infection, but they are permissive. Remember those words? <laughs> susceptible means they don't have a receptor. Permissive means the internal environment is suitable for the virus. So mouse cells are permissive for polio, but not susceptible. So Kathy cloned the poliovirus receptor, put it in mouse cells, and they got infected. So a subsequent student in my lab, Rebao Ren, then made transgenic mice producing the human poliovirus receptor gene. These animals then could be infected with polio. All you needed was the receptor. And you can see this animal is paralyzed. It's been injected uh, with poliovirus. And it's amazing, in fact, that there's not, the only thing between polio infecting mice is the receptor. Because as far as we know, polio naturally never infected mice in the wild. So the fact that mouse cells work to support polio infection is amazing in my view. But it works. Rebao went on to do a postdoc with David Baltimore. He's the only student from my lab who got into the Baltimore lab. And you've heard that name before. And I was just at his 80th birthday celebration last week. And Rebau was there, so it was a, a little. It, this is reminding me of that. He, uh, he did some fantastic work. Uh, David Baltimore, by the way, 80 years old in science for 60 years, and to hear the range of experiments he did is, was just fabulous. But even more amazing is the room. It was a room like this at Caltech, full of people, all that he trained, and it was like a who's who of science president of the University of Michigan, multiple heads of labs uh, at Harvard and MIT and, and other places. Really a remarkable career in science. And Rebauer had the fortune to go there, as I did. Really a great place. So this is one way you can make a mouse model, is to put receptors. And a few other virus models in mice have been done using this approach. And that means then you can infect mice with your virus and do, you can study how the virus causes disease. Remember, pathogenesis is the process of causing disease. And one aspect of pathogenesis we call viral virulence. That is the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. So if a virus causes disease, and there are various ways to measure it, as you will see in a moment, we, we call it a virulent virus. But some viruses do not cause any disease, as far as you can tell, and they're avirulent or attenuated. The ability to replicate in an animal is not enough to cause disease. It's required, it's necessary, but not sufficient, because replication may not be accompanied by disease and therefore would not be virulent. Now, we have to quantify virulence in order to compare, say, a mutant of a virus that we're making, and there are many ways that you can quantitative virulence. These are just some of them. One is just virus titer. I'm not a big fan of virus titer as a surrogate of virulence, because as I just said, viruses can replicate without causing disease. But many people, if you look in the literature, will say this virus replicates tenfold higher than the other, therefore it's more virulent. And I'm not, I don't really agree with that. I think you have to have some other measurements of virulence, like mean time to death or appearance of signs. Now, just to clarify again what I mean by signs. Symptoms are what you can feel. And you can tell your doctor, I have a stomach ache or a headache. Signs are what the doctor measures that you don't, may not be aware of, like the, the number of neutrophils in your blood. I don't think any of you would know that. Mice don't have symptoms because they can't tell you what's wrong with them. So in, in an animal model, you're always measuring signs. So those are very specific terms. You have to remember what they mean. So here we have mean to, time to appearance of signs because you can't have mean time to appearance of symptoms because it's in an animal model. Uh, measurement of fever, weight loss, pathological lesions. You can take out the tissue where the virus is replicating and cut it up and look under a microscope and see if there's evidence of 
cell destruction. HIV, we measure by, in one way, we measure by the number of CD4 positive T cells in your blood. A healthy adult has so many T cells per microliter of blood, and we know that HIV depresses that, and below a certain point, it leads to AIDS, as we'll talk about later. All right, so these are some quantifications of virulence. Now, what I want you to think about is that, as you will see, many of the signs and symptoms of a viral disease are actually caused by our immune response. I don't know what the fraction is, but I'd say it's more than half. And it's probably amazing to you, you know, when you get a cold or any kind of viral disease, gastroenteritis, well, that is really your immune response being over-exuberant, which it has to do to clear the infection. It's the price you pay. So this idea that a virus is more virulent, I have a little problem with. I think about this all the time because a virus being more virulent may simply be it's replicating a little better and, and the host is overreacting. So the virulence is not really a direct consequence of what's in the virus. It's an indirect consequence. Nevertheless, in the literature, this is not really distinguished. This is just a thing I, I like to think about a lot. And it's interesting in terms of the evolution of virulence, what would drive it. And this is something people study all the time, what drives virulence differences. And people like to think that viruses become more virulent as they circulate in people, which makes no sense to me. Unless the virus is replicating better, why would it make more disease? It doesn't make any sense, unless that helps to transmit. So that's viral virulence. And here are some examples of it, how we can measure it. So on the left is a very simple assay with poliovirus. We're infecting mice with two different strains of poliovirus. And uh, the type, what we're measuring, we have on the x-axis days after infection. And on the y-axis, we have number of survivors. So here the virulence is measured by survival or death. And you can see the mice infected with type 1 poliovirus, they survived the entire experiment. And the mice are actually infected intracranially. You have a tiny needle, very small gauge, and you can put it right in the skull. If you go up to a three-week-old mouse, it's very easy to slip the needle in. You anesthetize them first. Uh, you put like 50 microliters in. I know because we've done this a lot. And then the mice get up and run around like nothing ever happened to them. If you did it to you, you would have a severe headache and other problems as well. So mice can stand this intracerebral inoculation. These animals in the blue have been given polio and nothing happens to them. They're absolutely fine. And the ones with the red, which is a different type of polio, you can see they're dead <coughs> in 10 to 15 days. And on the right is a different kind of measurement of virulence. This is done by infecting mice with different types of viruses. We have a whole bunch of different ones here. Uh, these are all flaviviruses, like dengue virus, West Nile, yellow fever, and, and others. And then taking out the brain stem, the spinal cord, and the cerebrum, and slicing it up and looking to see if the virus is replicating by, if there's cell destruction, histopathological lesions. And uh, that's quantified here. So there, some kind of number is put to the lesion score, and you can compare the different viruses. And you can see that, and these, I believe, are all intracerebrally inoculated as well. So you can see put dengue virus in the brain. It's not particularly uh, able to cause disease in the brain. Now, the lesions caused by virus infection in the brain, that's a measure of virulence. And we have specific terms when we're looking in a particular tissue. So we're, when we're looking in nervous tissue, brain or spinal cord, we call it neurovirulence to specify it. So dengue has pretty low neurovirulence. And you can see the most virulent is Japanese encephalitis virus. And there's West Nile virus in the middle. And in fact, in humans, we know that in 5% of West Nile infections, the virus does get into the brain and causes encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, encephalitis. And we also know that dengue is rarely seen to cause encephalitis in people. So in that sense, these viruses mimic what's happening in people. That's why I say if you get a result in mice, you can then look in people and see if it parallels and makes sense. So that's just another way to measure virulence. Now, the most important thing you can understand about virulence is that it's a relative property. 
What do I mean by that? Because it's influenced by everything. The dose, of course, how much virus you put in, the root of infection, whatever animal you're using, the age of the animal, the gender, the general susceptibility of the host, and more. And what this all means is that you can't compare virulence very well of different assays. Of course, you can't compare different animals at all. You can't compare different routes of inoculation at all. You can only compare the same virus. Now, you can compare different polio viruses if you'd like. That's fine. But you can't compare polio with West Nile virus. It would simply not make any sense because it's a different virus. So you have to compare very similar viruses, and you have to assay virulence in the same way. If you want to compare two different polio viruses, like the one I just showed you here on the left, type 1 and type 2 polio viruses, they're both inoculated intracerebrally into mice of the same age and so forth. So it's very important to understand that. So many parameters affect virulence that you have to minimize that effect to really see what the viruses are doing, how they differ in what you do to the animals. Uh, people always ask me, what do you think is the most virulent virus? And you can't really answer it because it depends on so many things. If you want one number in people, I would say the case fatality rate, which is the number of people who died divided by the number of infections. And that's a hard number to get at most of the time. But rabies is almost 100%. So I would say that that's the most virulent virus that we have out there. But certainly if you did animal comparisons, you would get different results. So that's measuring viral virulence. So here's another example, an experimental example, of how the inoculation route can make such a big difference in virulence. Just maybe you don't believe me. So here's some data from others. And this is a virus, an arena virus, envelope virus with an RNA genome in pieces, and it's called lymphocytic choriomeningitis <coughs> virus. And this is a virus of rodents, not a human virus. Its natural host is mice, so you can do nice experiments in the laboratory with it. It turns out that if you were immunosuppressed, like if you've had an organ transplant or you have AIDS or some other virus infection that's immunosuppressive, and you have a pet hamster, you can get infected with this virus. And people have died of it because they're severely immunosuppressed. And so under those conditions, the virus will kill you. It's pretty rare, though. So don't get rid of your hamsters right away. Look at this, 100,000 PFU inoculated intraperitoneally. The mice are perfectly fine. They survive. But if you put one PFU right into the brain, they're all dead. So that is showing you the root of infection. This is exactly the same virus. 100,000 to 1 PFU, which is a nice illustration of why when you talk about virulence, you have to specify everything. And I remember this very well, because years ago when I started working on polio, Albert Sabin was alive. He's one of the people who made the, one of the two polio vaccines. And I would give talks, and he would get up. He would stand up. He's one of these people who stand up to ask a question, right? And it kind of is intimidating. I mean, this person was a giant in the field. And he would say, Dr. Racaniello, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're comparing virulence in different hosts. And, and, so, and he would also write me letters, and I have these still. You can find them. I put them on the internet. He would write, either you haven't read any of my papers on virulence of polioviruses, or if you did, you don't believe it. Wonderful guy. So this is important. You have to have exactly the same assay to compare virulence. OK, what statement about viral virulence is wrong? It can be influenced by dose, root of infection, species, age, gender, susceptibility of the host. It can be quantified by, quantified by measurement of fever. Ebola virus is more virulent than human papilloma virus. It's the capacity of a virus to cause disease in a host. When comparing virulence, the assays must be the same. So which one is wrong? C, Ebola is more virulent than human papilloma. Of course, that's wrong. You can't compare the virulence of different viruses. Now, one of the things we do in a virology research lab is we want to know what makes a virus more or less virulent. So we want to say what viral genes and what host genes are involved in determining whether a virus is more or less virulent. I'm going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about viral genes and host genes. Now, when I started in virology, you could only look at viral genes that were involved in virulence. We had no way to, couldn't sequence 
our own genomes to figure that out. But now we can, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. And the way we did this is we would take our virus of choice, like polio, make mutations in the genome. And that's why having a DNA copy of a viral genome is great, because you can make mutations in DNA. That was figured out in the late 70s and early 80s. So you could, like the PBS mutation in the retrovirus, you could introduce it in the DNA copy, put the DNA into cells and get out viruses with the mutation, and then you could put those in your animal model and figure out if your particular gene that you mutated is involved in virulence. So that's the assay. Mutate your virus, put it in animals, see the gene involved, and then try and go further. And here's an example of how that would work in a virus that is neurovirulent in mice. Here we have what we call wild-type virus, which simply means it's the standard, the unmutated standard that we're using. We inoculate intracerebrally, and this virus is neurovirulent. And you can imagine how you would measure neurovirulence. You could measure paralysis or death. So the wild type has a certain level of neurovirulence. Obviously, you have to quantify it so that you compare the other situations with it. And this virus forms nice plaques uh, in cell culture. Now we have a virus with a mutation that we've made, and we want to know if this gene is important for virulence. And you can see it affects viral titer. The plaques are small, and the titer is lower. Right There are fewer plaques there. And you put this in animals, and it barely causes disease. We call that attenuated. Attenuated means less virulent or avirulent. But that's not a really interesting gene, because it's simply a gene required for reproduction of the virus in cells. And so it's not surprising that the virus doesn't cause disease in animals because it's not growing. But the third situation here, we have a mutant virus, which grows perfectly well in cell culture, and now it's attenuated in the animal. So that is really the, the more exciting situation. That's a gene that is specifically needed to cause disease. It's not just needed for the virus to replicate. I mean, if you're interested in replication, that's fine. But if you want to know about disease, you have to have those kinds of genes, genes specifically required for virulence. And people have found these over and over again uh, in many different kinds of viruses that have been studied. Here are the kinds of genes that we find when we do that experiment and get that last category. The virus grows well, but in an animal, does not cause disease. We get genes involved in viral replication that are specific to the animal. It's very interesting. We get genes involved in invasiveness, the ability of a virus to, say, go from the periphery to the brain. If you inoculated the foot pad, get to the brain, that would be invasiveness. Tropism, it affects what tissues the virus grows in. A lot of really interesting genes have been involved that, whose gene products modify host defense mechanisms. You could imagine that those would make a virus more or less virulent. There are genes that enable the virus to spread in the host. Uh, and then there are some, not a lot of the last category, genes with intrinsic cell killing effects. These are genes that kill cells in the animal, and that contributes to the virulence. Let's take a look at some of these viral virulence genes. First of all, they don't have to encode proteins. We learned from studying with many viruses, this is an example with poliovirus, that non-coding regions can be involved in virulence. So here's the genome of poliovirus at the bottom. It's a plus strand RNA, seven and a half kilobases long, and at either end is a non-coding region. Non-coding means doesn't encode protein, right? It's not translated into protein. So at the five prime end is a non-coding region, and it's expanded here, and there, this happens to be highly folded to form the internal ribosome entry site, which allows translation independent of a cap, because these RNAs do not have caps. The vaccine strains of polio that are still used in many parts of the world, and we'll talk about those in some detail later in the vaccine lecture, they were made by Albert Sabin, the guy who said I didn't know what I was talking about. I guess he had the right to. <laughs> he isolated three strains of poliovirus. They all have a mutation in the five prime non-coding region that make them unable to cause disease. The way you take these vaccines, you, you ingest them, which is the normal route of infection with polio. They go into your intestine, they replicate, you get immunity, but you don't get paralyzed. It's not quite true, actually, but we'll see that later. <laughs> Most people don't get paralyzed. Uh, and they all have a mutation in the 5' prime non-coding region. Here, these are the three mutations in the three serotypes of polio, 1, 2, and 3. Single base changes. They block the ability of the virus to paralyze you. 
We don't know how these work. We studied them in my lab for ages. Never could figure out how they work. But here's an experiment showing you their effect, which is really remarkable. So here we have a, virulence, a, vir a neurovirulence assay uh, where the graph is measuring virus titers in the brain. And the virulence here on the top table is measured by the LD50. That's the amount of virus you have to inoculate into a mouse to paralyze half of them or to kill half. L means lethal. You could do PD50. Turns out, but our model P and L is the same. So for example, we have viruses that dis differ only at one base. So this is one of the bases changed in the vaccine. One virus has a U and the other has a C. The rest of the virus is exactly the same. And we infect mice intracerebrally. And you can see this top virus, you never reach an endpoint. You can put 10 to the 6 PFU into these animals and they don't get paralyzed, they're fine. Uh, but in these, if you change that single base to a C, 9,000 PFU will paralyze half the mice. So a single base change in a non-coding region has this dramatic effect on virulence. And it also affects the replication of the virus. And here is the growth curve of these viruses. Again, you inoculate the virus intracerebrally, and then every time point, which is one of these dots, you take a few mice, you sacrifice them, you take out the brain, grind it up, and you measure virus replication by plaque assay, PFU per gram of brain. And you can see the virus with a C has a nice increase and plateaus out. So it's replicating very nicely, and that's consistent with the uh, lethality. Whereas the, the virus with a U never, doesn't really replicate and eventually is cleared and it doesn't paralyze. So here's an example where I, I did measure virus growth, but not just virus growth. We measured lethality because I think that's the way you need to do it. So a non-coding region can affect virulence. And this has also been shown for other viruses as well. I think perhaps the most interesting are gene products that modify host defenses. And I've already emphasized to you that every virus genome has to encode at least one protein that antagonizes immune defenses. Otherwise, it won't be around. And so these have been discovered by mutation, by mutating viral genes and, and seeing that they no longer cause disease in animals and then figuring out the mechanism. So uh, genes that, uh, that uh, antagonize apoptosis, autophagy, or other intrinsic processes like apobex, the ones that deaminate the HIV genome. An interesting class is called virokines and viroceptors. So this is a play on the word cytokine and, and cytokine receptor. And remember, when a virus infects a host, the cells produce cytokines that are involved in immune responses, that are involved in inflammation. And those cytokines bind to receptors on, on immune cells and other cells to alert, to elicit their effects. And some virus genomes encode virokines, which are proteins that look very much like a cytokine. But when those proteins bind the cytokine receptor, no effect occurs. There's no signaling, and the original cytokine is blocked from binding the receptor, and nothing happens because the viral homologue has evolved to not have an effect. A viroceptor is a soluble protein that mimics the receptor for cytokines. So it floats around, in, around the infected cell. And the real cytokines being produced by infected cells bind this viroceptor. And of course, they never get to bind the real receptor on the host cell. So they're nice decoy proteins. They're proteins, viral proteins that bind complement proteins, that pathway that I told you about earlier. There are viral proteins that modify the MHC1 and 2. We talked about some of those. So all of these were discovered by these mutagenesis virulence assays. And the interesting thing is, and I guess this makes sense, they're not needed for replication in cell culture. Because in, in, in most cases, cells in culture don't have immune, at least adaptive responses. And so none of this matters. You can take the genes out, and the viruses grow very well. But when you put them in animals, they don't grow well at all. They don't cause disease because they're overwhelmed by the immune response because they can't antagonize it. And that's the basis for me saying so many times <laughs> every genome has to encode at least one of these. So here is an um, example of one of these experiments that identified a viral gene that is a viroceptor. This gene is, is a herpes virus gene. So this is a gamma herpes 68 
virus. This is a herpes virus of mice. So here is a case where people are trying to learn about herpes virus virulent by studying a virus, a closely related virus that infects mice. And the gene M3 encodes a chemokine receptor, what I called uh, before viroceptor. If you infect mice, uh, the virus uh, causes inflammation. In, in the infected tissues, you get a cellular infiltrate and the virus kills the mice. And the virulence is quantified here by survival. So wild type virus is blue and you, you infect mice and you measure survival at different doses of infection. So we have 0.1 to 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. You can see uh, there's a nice curve of increased, uh, less survival with increased virus, as you would expect. So most of the mice survive with a low dose, very few survive with a high dose. Now, if you delete the M3 gene from this virus, that's in green. Now you've, you've altered the survival curve dramatically. You can see now uh, intermediate levels of PFU don't cause anywhere near as many deaths as the wild type virus. And we could quantify this so we can compare them by looking at the 50% survival dose. So we just draw a line out here for the wild type virus, it looks like to be just slightly less than 10 PFU. But then the uh, mutant virus, it's closer to 1,000 PFU. So you can quantify this effect on virulence by looking at, that's why we look at 50% uh, levels. And then what was done in this experiment, so to take out the, the M3 gene, you have the genome in a plasmid, and you cut it out, and then you recover virus from it. But just to make sure nothing else happened during your manipulations, you put the gene back into the virus. And that's what's shown here in red, M3MR. MR stands for marker rescue. All that means, it's an old term for you make a mutant virus by removing a gene. You then put it back to make sure you haven't made any alterations accidentally anywhere else in the viral genome. And you can see that that is just as virulent as wild type. So a nice example of how a viral gene encoding an antagonist of the immune system is a virulence gene because this affects, it, it decreases the virulence of the virus in a mouse model. So here you could say, do human herpes viruses have these genes to try and extend the, the relevance to humans? So that's how a, an animal model can be valuable. You can do detailed studies, which you can't do with people, but then you can take what you learn and, and try and ask, is, is it relevant to people? Here's an example of a viral gene that is, is part of that class that damages host cell. I call these toxic viral proteins. There aren't too many of these. But this is one in a rotavirus. These are viruses that cause gastroenteritis, vomiting, and diarrhea. So you typically get them by contaminated foods, and um, then they replicate in your intestine and diarrhea and vomiting. And these viruses encode a protein called NSP4, which directly affects the intestinal epithelium, leading to the diarrhea. And we know the mechanism exactly. Here is NSP4. It has two effects on the intestinal epithelium. It inhibits a co-transporter, which is called the sodium glucose luminal co-transporter. And this is an important membrane pump, essentially. Co-transporter means that it pulls in one molecule and exports another at the same time. And here it's sodium and glucose. It's very important for maintaining fluid balances in the intestine. So this inhibition by NSP4 causes fluid to fail to be reabsorbed, and that's why you get diarrhea. And then this virus also stimulates the activity of a phospholipase C, a cytosolic enzyme, and that causes increases in calcium levels, which in turn also leads to fluid imbalance. So this protein explains the symptoms of diarrhea. In fact, people have made VP4 synthetically. And if you feed it to animals, it gives them diarrhea. You don't even have to have the virus replicating. So that's a great example of a toxic viral protein. There are also RNAs that can be virulence determinants. And this one happens to be an RNA in the cell. This is MIR-122, which we encountered before, I believe. This is a liver-specific microRNA. Remember, microRNAs are small RNAs made by host cells that are, their function is to regulate gene expression. MIR-122 is involved in regulating cholesterol synthesis. 
by regulating the synthesis of one of the enzymes involved. It turns out that it's absolutely required for hepatitis C virus replication because it binds to the five prime non-coding region. We've seen this before, but we can repeat it here. On the left is a diagram of the five prime non-coding region of hepatitis C virus. It's highly structured like that of poliovirus. It's an internal ribosome entry site. And two copies of MIR-122 bind this five prime UTR and they stabilize it against nucleolytic degradation. And so this MIR-122 is absolutely required for viral virulence in the liver. Without MIR-122, the virus doesn't replicate and you don't get hepatitis. And as I said before, there is a drug that has been developed and which has been tested in people. It's called Miravircin. And it binds MIR-122 and prevents it from binding the viral genome. So you take this drug orally, gets into your blood, uh, it gets into the liver, it binds MIR-122, and it prevents it from stabilizing hep C. It's very effective in uh, preventing or curing uh, hepatitis C virus replication. It's one of many drugs we have now that really can be used to eliminate this infection. But an interesting example of a cellular RNA required for virulence. Part of pathogenesis, of course, and you've, you've heard me say this before, I'll repeat it, there are two halves. There's what the virus does, and there's what your immune response does. So let's talk about what the virus can do. Uh, these are some of the ways that viruses kill cells. So obviously, if a virus is killing neurons in your spinal cord, that is part of the pathogenesis, and that killing of neurons can result in paralysis. So many viruses are cytolytic. That simply means they kill cells. And that killing can happen in a number of ways. Remember, we talked about cytopathic effects at the very beginning of this course. And that is changes, visible changes in cells infected with viruses. And this is visible changes that are happening in an, in an infected animal. That can be triggered by apoptosis, necrosis, pyroptosis. These are different kinds of cell death that are induced via different pathways. Viruses can do that. Many viruses encode Viroporins, as, as the name suggests, these are proteins that poke holes in membranes. The contents of the cell leak out and the cell dies. It's another way of killing a cell. Many viruses inhibit the synthesis of host proteins, as we talked about some time ago. Many viruses inhibit RNA and DNA synthesis as well. And you can imagine that a cell that is not undergoing any cellular macromolecular synthesis it's going to get sick after a while. And in fact, the membranes lose their integrity. They begin to leak. The lysosomes, which are vesicles in the cells containing nasty enzymes, RNases and DNases and proteases, they get permeable, they leak, they start to digest the cell. All this contributes to cell death. And then if you remember from way back at the beginning, syncytium formation by envelope viruses, which bud from cells, they cause neighboring infected cells to fuse and make a giant cell with many nuclei, that's a syncytium. That's a form of cell death as well. So multiple ways that viruses can injure cells, and clearly these can make a contribution to whatever pathology the virus is causing in, in the individual. For example, you know, HIV infection causes a dramatic drop in the CD4 positive lymphocyte count in your blood. And that's because the virus is cytolytic. It replicates in those cells and it kills them. It's a very straightforward pathology. But not all pathology is. And we'll come back to that later. Here's a great example of something we learned very recently. And that is the microbiome that we have can influence the ability of viruses to replicate. And this one was discovered with poliovirus. It was done by a laboratory at UT Southwestern. And this is poliovirus infection of the transgenic mice that I told you about earlier. And this is looking at the effect of depleting the microbiome. So you can treat mice with antibiotics. So antibiotics, ABX, that's what that stands for. So here on the left, we're looking at bacterial count per gram of, or per milligram of feces of the mice. So untreated mice have lots of bacteria in their feces, a very easy assay to do just grind up the feces and do a colony count on a plate. If you treat the mice with antibiotics, you severely depress the number of bacteria in their feces. It doesn't eliminate it entirely, but you severely 
depress it. And you can reconstitute that. You can feed mice, bacteria. I think here they fed mice their own feces, and mice don't seem to care. And you can recolonize these animals that were previously untreated. The right graph is the effect of all this on virus replication. So we're looking at replication in percent. And now you have untreated mice in the circles, time post inoculation, you feed mice the virus orally, it goes into their gut and replicates. And you can see this is replicating quite nicely. And if you have antibiotic treated mice, nothing. Virus can't replicate without the right complement of bacteria in the gut. So your microbiome can be a virulence factor. And it doesn't have to be just the gut. As you know, we have bacteria everywhere. And so they can influence your susceptibility to infection. And that's something that medicine has to take into account. You know, there's a whole trend towards personalized medicine where people are gonna sequence your genome and figure out what diseases you have. But if they don't consider the microbiome, it's not gonna be good enough Okay, the next question is, which statement about determinants of viral virulence is wrong? Virulence genes can encode proteins, viral proteins. Virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. They are the same in all viruses. They can be found in untranslated regions. They may encode immune modulators, which is wrong. Most of you got C there, the same in all viruses. That's clearly incorrect. A few of you were uncertain of whether or not virulence genes can encode cellular proteins. And I would say that uncertainty should have been trumped <laughs> by the statement that they are the same in all viruses, which I went to great lengths to say is not right. The other half of virulence is what the cell does to you. And this is mainly what we call immunopathology or too much of a good thing, because an immune response is good for you, right? Because it resolves or prevents virus infection, but sometimes it also causes disease. And this is the definition, the clinical symptoms of disease. Doesn't matter what they are, fever, tissue damage, aches, pains, nausea, tiredness. Most of those are consequences of uh, immune response. And you can tell right away that they are because they're pretty much present in most virus infections. We have a lot of viruses that do not kill cells. They are non-cytopathic, yet they cause disease, they cause both signs and symptoms in the infected host. In those cases, the signs and symptoms are entirely due to the immune response, not the virus itself. Of course, the immune response is responding to the virus. The virus isn't killing any cells. And there are different kinds of immunopathology that people have studied and ascribed to very specific components of the immune system. These are all adaptive immunopathologies, but there are Innate immunopathologies interfere on, I mentioned. It's a terrible thing to make a lot of because it makes you fear very badly. And if you've ever known anyone who's on interferon therapy, you know that they don't like it. It makes you feel really badly and they want to stop. And in fact, for hep C, that was the only therapy for many years. And it's problematic. You know, in general, if a drug makes you feel bad, people will stop taking it, and that's very bad because that will select for resistant viruses. In the early days of AIDS therapy, the drugs made you feel terrible, and a lot of people would stop, and that generated resistance. So there are innate immunopathologies, but here let's focus on some <coughs> adaptive immunopathologies. You can see all the arms of the adaptive response are represented here. We have CD8 positive, T cell mediated, and here on the right are some of the viruses that we know some of the signs and symptoms are due to these specific subsets. CD4 T cell mediated, both Th1 and Th2. Remember, these are two different uh, arms, one dealing with the induction of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, the other dealing with the production of antibodies. And there's even B cell mediated immunopathology, which of course is caused by antibodies. So antibodies against viruses, which I told you can be protective, can also cause pathology. So let's go through some of these and see how they work. Here is an a, a, uh, example of disease mediated by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. I have a couple of examples of this. Remember, these are the cells produced during the adaptive response, which identify virus-infected cells and kill them. They lyse them by the mechanisms we talked about last time, granzyme and perforin mediated mechanism. So here's an example to illustrate that these can be bad for you, or at least for a mouse in this case. 
So here we have uh, mice infected with LCMV. This is the mouse virus we talked about earlier. We put intracerebrally LCMV. Eight days later, the mice are dead with lethal chorio meningitis, which is infection of a particular part of the brain. Now we do the same experiment. You have to do it exactly the same, intracerebral inoculation. We give the mice immunosuppressants. You could give them steroids or some other kind of immunosuppressant. And then these mice live. In fact, they could live forever. They have a persistent infection. But if you at any time give them T cells from another mouse that's been infected, then they die. Adoptive immunization means you give the animal an immune product from another immunized animal. So this immunosuppression prevented the generation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, but when you give them back from another mouse, that's what kills them. And you can do this in very sophisticated ways. You can specifically delete certain kinds of T cells from animals and see the effect on this virulence. So a nice example of disease caused by CTL. So you didn't think CTLs could kill you. Well, uh, put virus right in your brain, it would. And so the question, of course, is in humans, are there any cases where CTLs would harm you? And yes, the answer is yes. People who need to get heart transplants, lots of those around. Do you know why? Most of the time it's because they have a virus infection of the heart. They've had that since they were young and they didn't know it. And it slowly destroys their heart tissue until it's too late and they have to have a transplant. And probably the pathology is caused mainly by CTLs. So if we could have picked up the infection, maybe we could design uh, some inhibitors. So here's the evidence for that in mice anyway. These are two separate experiments. On the top, we have infection of, of mice with LCMV. And this is gonna to prove to you that lethality is caused by cytotoxic T cells. So we have two different kinds of mice in this experiment. Wild type mice plus plus, and the other mice lack the gene encoding perforin. Perforin is the product that CTLs use, one of the products that CTLs use to kill the infected cell target. You can make, make mice that lack perforin and they're fine. And you can see here, if you infect these mice with LCMV wild type mice, perforin plus plus, percent live, that's what we're measuring here is virulence. You see they're all dead in 10 days and if you infect the mice lacking perforin, they survive. On the right, we're measuring liver enzymes in the blood. So liver enzymes are normally confined to the liver. That's where they should be. Not supposed to be in your blood. If they are, it means you have something going on in your liver like virus infection, which is killing liver cells. So here we're measuring a particular liver enzyme, GLDH, in the serum. And you can see wild type mice infected with LCMV uh, five days or so after the, the serum levels go up. So that means the virus is damaging liver cells. And you can see the perforin knockout mice. There's no enzyme in serum, so that means there's no liver damage. You could measure this other ways as well, but it's a very nice uh, representation of it. So this is an example of how CD8 plus lymphocytes can cause tissue damage, in this case, the liver. And we know this by genetically modifying the mice to remove one of the ways that the CTLs kill. Now on the bottom is an infection of mice with a different virus. This is a Coxsackie virus, which is a polio-like virus. And this one happens to infect the heart muscle. And it's a kind of virus that infects humans and makes them have to have heart transplants, Coxsackie viruses. Named after Coxsackie, New York. These are two sections of heart tissue from a mouse that's been infected with Coxsackie virus. The virus is replicated in the heart. And on the left, that the section has been stained with a dye that stains for calcifications caused by heart cell damage. So all this blue is damage to the heart cells associated with virus infection. So this, this is what's happening in people infected with Coxsackie viruses and why they need a heart transplant. On the right, you, you can see there's no tissue damage. What do you think these, which gene do you think these mice lack? Perforin, it's on the same slide, right. It's perforin. These are perforin knockout mice. No tissue damage. The virus is replicating here, but there's no tissue damage. So this could be translated to people, right? The problem is we can't diagnose these infections early enough. You can't just screen everyone for virus infections. That is not ethical. 
You never try and go to your doctor and say, can you screen me for rhinovirus? They won't do it unless there's some reason to screen you. So we have to have non-invasive screening methods, which we don't have yet. But it's my magic mirror. I think one day you're going to get up in the morning, stand in front of a mirror, it's going to scan you and tell you what infections you have that day. And if it finds Coxsackie virus, then you can go to a doctor's office and get it confirmed and maybe get an inhibitor of perforin to prevent heart cell damage. This is absolutely doable. This is going to happen. There will be scanners in your home <laughs> that are hardwired to your doctors. The problem is they'll be hacked by Facebook and you know, that, that'll be an issue there. So that's CT8s. CTLs, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are CD8 plus T cells. There are also lesions associated with CD4 positive lymphocytes. And these tend to be more damaging because these cells make lots of cytokines. And those cytokines recruit other cells, like macrophages and neutrophils and so forth. And they cause tissue damage. I mean, they're being recruited to protect the infected area, but they also cause collateral damage. And they release proteases, reactive radicals like peroxides. Cytokines like TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha is particularly damaging to tissues, as the name might suggest. So let me give you an example of some CD4 lesions. And this one is herpes stromal keratitis. This is a good reason not to put your fingers in your eye, especially if you have a cold sore, because this is one of the most common causes of blindness in developed countries, and it is pretty much all immunopathological, and it's caused by CD4 positive Th1 cells. What happens is you get multiple infections, and each time you get your cornea becomes more and more opaque until it's completely opaque, as you can see here, and you can't see anymore. So here's what happens. This, these are sections of corneal epithelium, right? The cornea of your eye is covered with a sheet of epithelial cells, which you can see stained in blue on the left and in red on the right. And that's where the virus replicates. When you contaminate your eye with herpes viruses, it replicates in the epithelial cells. But the, the problems happen in the underlying stromal cells. Those are the white ones that are not stained very well there. These cells are the ones that become opaque because they're damaged by cytokines produced by CD4 positive Th1 cells. The damage occurs because the virus replicates in the epithelium. CD4 Th1 cells come in, they make cytokines that seep into the stroma and they cause damage in the stroma as well. And there are also CD4 cells in the stroma, which you can see uh, on this section on the right, the epithelial layer is much thinner because it's been infected with herpes virus. And all these CD4 cells are in the epithelium and the stroma as well. And they're secreting cytokines, and that damages the stroma and causes the opacity and blindness. Uh, one more example of a cellular basis, encephalitis caused by West Nile virus. Here the culprit is uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, a specific cytokine. And the observation was made that mice lacking toll-like receptor 3, which is a sensor of RNA, it's a sensor of RNA viruses, they're more resistant to lethal infection. So if you infect mice with West Nile virus, a certain fraction of them will, will have virus in the brain and develop encephalitis. And it was found that if you simply knock out TLR3, that's reduced. And the reason is that tumor necrosis factor alpha compromises the blood-brain barrier and allows the virus to get in. So imagine you inoculate mice peripherally, the mice are making TNF-alpha in response to sensing by TLR3, and that TNF-alpha goes to the brain, it's a soluble protein, and causes the capillaries in the brain to become permeable, and the virus hops across, and that's why you get encephalitis. And you can show that in this experiment. These are brains from West Nile-infected mice. On the top, we have wild-type mice, and so these are infected peripherally, with West Nile virus, and then they're injected with a blue dye, which is how you can see the permeability of the brain capillaries, because the dye gets into the brain and it makes the brains blue, as you can see very nicely there. So by day three, wild-type mice, their brains are blue, because the, T the TNF alpha produced after sensing virus infection permeabilizes the capillaries. Otherwise, the, um, the dye would not get into the brain. These brains would not be blue. On the bottom is the toll-like receptor 3 knockout. You can see day 3, there's a big difference. Very little blue, if any, and then only a little bit at day 5. And that's because no TNF-alpha is produced. 
and it doesn't loosen up the capillary. So a nice example, again, of how the immune response can be detrimental. Many virus infections lead to poxes and rashes, which we talked about before, and these are typically immune reactions. Th1 cells, CD, CD4 Th1 cells, uh, and, and macrophages are coming into the skin. There are viruses replicating in the skin that attracts a variety of immune cells. Uh, they make cytokines. The cytokines permeabilize your capillaries so that T cells can come in and help with the infection, and all that makes the rash. The rash is an immunopathological reaction to infection. That young child there has a measles rash, and just think every one of those red lesions is caused by immune responses to virus infection. There is virus in the rash, but the, the rash itself is an immunopathological response. Now for a immunopathology based on antibody or B cells, and this, the classic one is dengue virus infection. So dengue virus is a flavivirus, which is transmitted mainly by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes among people. This disease is endemic in areas where the mosquito is present. It's rarely in the US. It is imported into the US, but it does not spread because our Aedes aegypti population is mainly limited to the southern states in the numbers needed to sustain transmission. There have only been a few tra local transmissions in Florida and Texas, but in other parts of the world you can see Billions of people are at risk for being infected. There are about 400 million infections every year with mosquitoes carrying dengue virus, second only to malaria. And this is really quite amazing. I think I talked about this before. You know, a mosquito takes a blood meal. Female mosquito takes blood meal to, in order to mature their eggs. Mosquito lives 14 days, 14 to 21 days. That's the lifespan. And most mosquitoes only take one blood meal and then they die. You can't spread a virus infection if you only take one blood meal. Because if you're a naive mosquito, you take a blood meal, you may pick up virus, but you're gonna die before you spread it. In order to spread it, you have to take two blood meals. And less than 0.1% of mosquitoes take two blood meals. So I once asked someone, why do we get any infections? And the answer is, there are a lot of mosquitoes out there. <laughs> so 0.1% is a lot of mosquitoes. Dengue was almost eradicated in the Southern Hemisphere. Here at the top is the current countries with confirmed dengue. You can see in countries with Aedes aegypti. And on the bottom left here, these are South American countries with dengue. Prior to 1981 on the left, no dengue. Why? Does anyone know why there was no dengue? DDT, remember? You're too young to remember DDT, but we used to use it left and right to kill mosquitoes. It's really good. Unfortunately, it kills a lot of other things as well. So they banned it. And after 1981, mosquitoes came back, and now we have lots of dengue, and it's spread really efficiently by the used tire trade. So when you, you know, get rid of your tires, they charge you five bucks to recycle your tires, but they don't recycle them. They put them on ships and ship them somewhere else, and maybe they're recycled somewhere else. But those ships are just open, and it rains, and the mosquitoes live and they're brought somewhere else. You can't get rid of all the water in these tires. There's too many of them and it would just fill up again. So they are what spread mosquitoes globally and so that's why we have now dengue everywhere. Primary dengue infection is mostly asymptomatic, febrile illness, aches and pains in your bone. That's why it's called dengue, break bone fever, self-limiting. Uh, there is a very serious complication, two serious complications, a hemorrhagic fever, or shock syndrome, where you have capillaries breaking, you bleed and you lose fluids and you can die. But that's one in 14,000 cases. And you get infected and you make antibodies which prevent infection, but there are four serotypes of dengue virus. And if you were infected with a second serotype, you, you don't have protection. And that's when the incidence of more severe disease increases. After secondary infections, you get hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome at a rate of one to 90 and one to 50 compared to one in 14,000. And the reason is, after primary infection, you make antibodies, say the type one dengue, and then if you get infected with type two dengue, the antibodies will bind the virus, but it will not block infectivity. These are non-neutralizing antibodies. But macrophages and other cells with FC receptors will bind the antibody, pull the virus in, so it now can get into cells that it normally doesn't replicate in. You get higher titers and you get a bigger cytokine storm as a consequence, a more exuberant immune response, and that's what causes 
the hemorrhagic feature and shock syndrome. So this is a real problem because billions of people are getting infected. And so now we have uh, a vaccine that has been licensed in some countries and, and others are in development. Some viruses cause immunosuppression. That is, they damage your immune response. They can replicate in cells of the immune system. They can uh, disturb the cytokine balances that are needed. And of course, if these viral proteins or viral receptors or viral kinds, they can skew the cytokine response as well. Here's an example of immunosuppression during measles virus infection. So measles is a classic immunosuppressing virus. Particular measure of immunosuppression here is a, a tuberculosis time test. If you've ever been given a TB test, you know they take a little thing with needles on it and they, they poke it into your, your forearm and that needle has antigen, tuberculosis antigen. If you have been infected before, you get a big swelling, which are T cells primed for TB coming into the area and causing swelling. So this experiment, they took kids with measles at different times uh, during the rash and after the rash, and they did TB tests on them. You can see before infection, this is the, in duration is how, how raised the TB test gets. With the rash, you absolutely have no in duration at all. You're completely immunosuppressed, and that starts to go away after the rash subsides. So this is a transient immunosuppression. Uh, and the mechanism is caused, in, in this case, by redirecting the immune response. When you have viruses sensed by antigen-presenting cells, they'll make cytokines that say, favor Th1 responses, cytotoxic T lymphocyte. And that's IL-12 is one of the main cytokines that directs the response to a Th1 response. If measles virus infects an antigen-presenting cell, it blocks the synthesis of IL-12. And it redirects uh, the response to a Th2 response, which is, of course, making antibodies. But for many infections, antibodies don't help. And that's why you have susceptibility to other infections. You have in immunosuppression. And here are some examples besides measles, which we talked about. Measles infects many immune cells, monocytes, DC, epithelial cells. Rubella is another immunosuppressor, and of course HIV, which infects T cells, and we'll talk about that in quite some detail. I want to end up with a discussion of host genes that affect susceptibility. One of the most famous is a gene encoding the co-receptor for HIV. HIV binds to CD4, the green molecule, but it also requires a second molecule, a co-receptor, and one of them, CCR5. About 4 to 16 percent of the world's population lack the gene encoding this protein. They lack a good part of it, so they don't make the protein. And a number of years ago, a German patient that had AIDS was getting a bone marrow replacement because he also had leukemia. So this is where they destroy your bone marrow, they radiate it, and then they get a donor and they uh, inject the donor's bone marrow into you and it repopulates you. And the physician was smart. He said, I'm going to get a donor that's delta 32 for CCR5 because this patient had AIDS. Let's see what happens. Well, that was the only patient who's been cured because cured means no more cells with proviral DNA in them. And people have tried this many times. For some reason, it doesn't work. But if you have this mutation, you don't get AIDS because the virus can't get into your cells. So the German patient didn't have this mutation before, but then after he got the bone marrow transplant, all his cells were mutated. Another example of a host genes that determines susceptibility, herpes simplex. When you're young, you get infected with herpes. You get a mild rash. The virus becomes latent in your trigeminal ganglia if it's an oral infection. Periodically, you have reactivation and, and cold source form, but sometimes the virus goes into your brain and causes encephalitis. And this is about one in 250,000 cases of herpes per year, and it can be very serious if not treated. And so a number of years ago, a group at Rockefeller said, people who get this herpes encephalitis, is there anything different about them? And we now have ways to sequence genomes and ask that question. So we use genome-wide association studies, GWAS, and we look for single nucleotide polymorphisms, mutations that are associated with, say, the propensity to develop herpes encephalitis. And they identified a number of genes, TLR3, UNC93B, TRIF, TRAF3, that are mutated in people who get serious herpes simplex encephalitis. Now, TLR3 is one of the toll-like receptors that sense virus infection. 
and all these other genes encode proteins that are involved in the functional TLR3 pathways. TRIF is one of the cytosolic proteins associated with the signal transduction pathway. unc 93 b is actually a ER protein that's important for getting a TLR3 into the endosome. Mutations in the TLR3 pathway are determinants of increased susceptibility to herpes simplex encephalitis. And here's a plausible mechanism. Defects in either TLR3 or any of the proteins in that pathway lead to a diminished sensing of herpes simplex infections. In other words, when herpes simplex virus uh, is, say, reactivated from latency, there is a diminished innate immune response because of the defects in TLR3 pathways. The virus, as a consequence, can replicate to higher levels, and perhaps that leads to an enhanced ability to invade the brain and cause encephalitis. This shows that sequencing the genome will someday be able to predict the susceptibilities of individuals to various diseases and perhaps lead to appropriate therapies to prevent serious infections. Age is another important determinant of susceptibility. The young and the very old tend to be the most susceptible to disease. Paradoxically, the young have an immature immune response, which means they have greater freedom from immunopathology, but they are still more susceptible to disease than individuals of intermediate age. And these differences can be recapitulated during LCMV infection of mice. Intracerebral infection of adults is lethal. Infant mice survive. And that's because the infants don't have the T-cell response that is, in fact, the cause of lethality. We talked about this earlier today. Older individuals have less elastic alveoli. They have weaker respiratory muscles, a diminished cough reflex. And all of this is thought to, in part, contribute to an increased susceptibility to infection. And here's a nice uh, picture of influenza's mortality pattern. We're looking at deaths in different age groups in this period. And you can see the very young and the very old are particularly susceptible. There are other determinants of susceptibility that we don't really understand. There are gender susceptibilities. Pregnant women are particularly susceptible to more infections, presumably because of immunosuppression. Malnutrition is a big one. In fact, measles is 300 times more lethal in developing countries because of malnutrition in the kids that get it. So this plays a role in the specific mechanisms we don't know. Cigarette smoking increases susceptibility to, to uh, respiratory infections, air pollution, and stress. Take an exam, you probably are more susceptible to uh, infections. So next time we're going to start talking about the patterns of virus infections. We're going to begin with acute ones, the ones that come and go in a defined period of time.